What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Restless Corpse, and I am here to tell you how to survive in Final Fantasy XV. Now, there are a lot of tip guides out there. I've seen a whole bunch, and while most of them are good, a lot of them don't have some of the information that I feel helps out in, like, a real-world situation, quote-unquote, in the game. So I'm going to be going over a couple things, mostly combat, though, in this, because I've seen a lot of threads on Reddit and things like that where people are just having real problems understanding the combat. Now, I have put over 100 hours into the game. I've done everything there is to do in Final Fantasy XV, so hopefully you can take it from me, and these will help you out. Number one. For God's sakes, switch your layout to Layout C. Now this comes down to personal preference, but when I started the game playing on the default Layout A, I was having a real problem attacking and guarding when the prompts came up. So with Layout C, your attack is on the right trigger, or the L R2, I guess, for PS4 players, and your guard is on the left trigger, or L2 for PS4 players. This just makes a little bit more sense for me because you always have your fingers over those buttons. You can easily keep attacking and then when the prompt comes up, just tap the left trigger or L2 or, you know, hold it and easily get those parries. And then you've already got your finger on the attack button, so just smash it again and you've got a, a counter attack. Uh, it can mean life or death sometimes. And we'll be talking about why that is important in number two. Most of the fights in this game can actually be won without ever hitting the attack button. Now this comes down to parries and counters. It's very essential that you have an easy way to do both of these very quickly in some instances because enemies like Tonberries will continue to attack after you've parried them and countered them. They'll just do it over and over and over, so you want to be able to get to it quick. Now, remember that the game is only over when Noctis dies. Your party members can die as many times as they want, but as long as Noctis is alive, you have a fighting chance. So, sometimes the best policy for a fight is to play defensively. If you're holding the guard button, sometimes it may make a fight take a little bit longer, but it is the safest way. Now, I don't necessarily recommend this for every fight. Some fights you can just get by, you know, mashing the attack or holding the attack or whatever. Uh, but a lot of these fights do get pretty tough toward the end game, and it helps to be defensive. Number three, heal cast. It's important, guys. Remember that magic is not only for attacking in this game. Even though the magic seems pretty simple in the outset, it's actually a little bit more deep than most people seem to realize. With a heal cast, when you cast your spell, it instantly heals you, depending on the level of the heal that you've added into it. Now, the easiest and cheapest way to do this is to use one element of any, you know, fire, ice, or lightning, just one, and add two high potions to it. Adding four regular potions also does the trick, but adding two high potions is the cheapest way, in my opinion, to get to the heal level 99. Now, as long as Noctis isn't in danger mode, it doesn't matter how low his maximum HP has gotten from the fighting. If you cast a heal level 99 heal cast, it's going to instantly refill your HP all the way up to max. Now, this is crucial for getting out of tough situations. It's also crucial for a specific endgame dungeon where you're unable to use items. And uh, it allowed me to get through it on, we'll say, the second try. I got all the way to the end, got my ass kicked, but I went back and I, and I showed him what's up. But it is absolutely important to remember that you can actually make heal spells. Now, these spells don't actually heal anyone else, and they actually do damage to enemies, but they heal the caster. Now, one thing to note is that you can always also put these on the other people in your party in their secondary slot. Now, whether they use them or not is entirely up to them. It's random. But if you have it in there on a tough fight, they will eventually use it, and they'll heal themselves to full. Again, this is most important in the endgame dungeon, the level 99 dungeon, where you're unable to use items, but it will help you the entire time throughout the game. Number four, air dancing. Now, air dancing might seem kind of weird and frivolous at the beginning, but it actually really, really helps. 
the amount of time that you are in the air means that you're not on the ground able to get hit by most enemies. Now, some big enemies will still be able to knock you right out of the air, and flying enemies obviously will be able to attack you, but air dancing is crucial. Now, it's important that you get all the way up to the actual air dance skill in the ascension grid for this to work, uh, as if you only have the regular air dance, you can only do it once. Basically, what air dancing is, is if you attack while you're in the air, Noctis will teleport to the enemy and attack him. You can attack up to three times before he'll fall to the ground. If you have the air dance skill, you can do this indefinitely, which means that all you need to do is hold the attack button, and every time he attacks three times, uh, I generally do two just so I can stay on the move, but every time he attacks three times, if you are holding the attack button, you just flick that left stick, and he will air dance and then continue attacking. Now, this is very important for enemies like Malboros and uh, Morbles and Maldooms because it's very important that you stay behind these enemies. And with an air dance, it's easy. You just air dance around them, stay in the back, keep hitting them. You can actually kill these rather tough enemies without ever being touched. Now, as I said, there are times when an enemy will knock you right out of the air, and that's just something that you've got to deal with. But for the most part, air dancing is a very decent and viable skill all the way to end game. There are going to be enemies that you don't want to stand toe to toe with and air dancing really really helps. Number five, warp points and knowing when to warp away from a fight. Now there are viable hit and run tactics with most enemies you can use. There are some enemies like the samurai looking guys which will, um, if you warp strike them, there's a chance that they will just impale you right out of the air. But barring that, warping away is a viable hit and run tactic especially when there are warp points around the map sometimes there aren't and when there aren't it still works but when there are warp points around the map it makes it absolutely easy because you never run out of mp so generally you're going to want to warp to a warp point at the beginning or you know at any point in the fight and then you can warp strike the enemy now the reason this is important is because warp strike damage is actually calculated or like dependent on how far away from the enemy you are. So if you warp to a warp point and then you warp strike an enemy, you're going to do more damage than warp striking him from like point blank range. So you'll warp to a warp point, then you'll target the enemy, warp strike, and while you're warp striking, hold the warp button again. And it, if there is a warp point in your view on the other side, you'll instantly warp to that. You can do this back and forth all damn day until you kill that enemy, depending on what enemy type it is. Number six, weight mode. In the early game, weight mode is a godsend. It actually really helps if you don't know a whole lot about the combat or you haven't figured out the subtle nuances of this combat system. Weight mode really, really does help. It allows you to stop time and plan out your next move. There are actually some parts, even in late game, where weight mode actually helps. And these are things where you're trying to break a specific arm or leg or just body part of an enemy. Uh, weight Weight mode actually helps you target that because the time is stopped and you don't have to worry about this thing bearing down on you while you're trying to get to the correct like body part. So weight mode actually really helps a lot of times, but after you get good at combat and most of the time in late game, you really don't want weight mode on because it just slows the flow of combat. Uh, it's really hard to like keep time going when you're trying to stand still, although if you insist on continuing to use warp mode or weight mode, if you don't want time to stop, you can just hold your defend button and time will keep going like it usually does. Number seven, the tech bar. The tech bar is actually pretty damn important. And there is an easy way to start each fight with at least one bar, possibly two. Now, when you run up on an enemy, you'll notice that there is a big red circle. That is their aggro range. If you stand just inside it, the tech bar immediately starts to rise. Now, depending on the skills you have in your ascension, uh, it could be fast or slow. When you go into an enemy's aggro range, they'll start to walk toward you very slowly. Now, this is enough time to at least get one bar, depending on the enemy. So, just stand there and wait for it. And this is especially good if you want to start with like a big hit from Gladiolus or something, uh, with like Dawn Hammer or Impulse. I tend to not really use it all that much anymore, but around mid-game and early game, I, I use it a lot with like Piercer from Prompto. It really helps, especially if you're having, you know, if you're having problems with a tough fight. 
Now, speaking of piercer, number eight is piercer is a great oh shit button. It only costs one tech bar, and as long as Prompto is alive, if you're fighting something, if you're going head to head or toe to toe with it, and it's about to do something really big that's difficult to dodge or is undodgeable, and it's really going to screw you up, you can, if you see it happening, because most enemies have like a visual tell, uh, you can quickly hit Piercer. And what what techs do in this game is everybody that is involved in the tech that you're trying to use will be pulled out of combat, technically. It's like a cutscene. They're invincible during this time. So with Piercer, it's Prompto and Noctis. Now Noctis obviously being your most important character, this gets Noctis out of out of harm's way pretty quickly and piercer actually starts up very quick as well so if you see the enemy doing something crazy that you don't think you can dodge or you don't have time to dodge just hit piercer and it'll save you or it should now speaking of techniques number nine is regroup regroup is an essential skill early in the game it's uh it's one of ignis's techniques and it will save your ass time and time again until you have built up enough of a bank of like potions and things like that regroup is essentially a full party heal that comes at two tech bars now it won't heal your maximum hp damage but it'll heal you up uh, like your whole party up to that maximum hp or up to whatever their maximum hp is not only that but it'll teleport everybody back to ignis so Assuming that Ignis is in a relatively safe spot, it could get your guys out of danger. Now, just like all other techs, everybody is invincible during the cutscene for this technique. Number 10, Dawn Hammer or Impulse. Now, Gladio starts with Cyclone, and Cyclone is a great skill, don't get me wrong, but Dawn Hammer is so much better, especially for single target enemies. Dawn Hammer has a decently long technique cutscene, and it is a powerful hit from not only Gladio, but Noctis on a single target. I've noticed that Don Hammer tends to break things a lot, and that's really good because obviously if you break an enemy it lowers their defense and you can tear it up a little bit easier. The problem with Don Hammer and why it isn't my favorite Gladio technique is that the first hit is from Gladio, it tends to do a ridiculous amount of damage, especially in late game when it's hitting all nines or if you have him limit break, it can do even more. But the second hit is always from Noctis, and you can't get a limit break for Noctis. So there's a possibility that the first hit from Gladio will do over 9,999, but the second hit won't. Now Gladio's second ability, or the, the ability past that, is Impulse, and Impulse is absolutely amazing. Not only is it a cone in front of you, although I've noticed that it tends to hit enemies behind as well. I think it's just enemies around Gladio, but it's a two hit, technique and both hits come from gladio so if you have him limit broken he can do a ridiculous amount of damage with it he'll raise his sword swing his sword it will stop time and then he'll swing his sword again sending out a shockwave that hits everything in its path two times now like i said sometimes it tends to hit everything in the area it says it's a cone on the ascension grid but it feels like it's just uh, an aoe around him or anything is close even if it's off screen it's a really good skill I really recommend Impulse. It doesn't take very many AP to get to it. Try it out, it's amazing. Number 11, the Royal Arms. Now, when I first started playing and I started gathering these Royal Arms, it really put me off the fact that if you use them, it damages your health by each strike. Now, it took me a while to realize that that is not the best part about the Royal Arms. Number one, they increase your armager damage the more royal arms found in a crew so you want to go looking for those royal arms asap but the best part about them is that you can equip four different items on noctis four different weapons if you have the royal arms equipped in a slot you get the bonus from that royal arm sometimes it's strength sometimes it's a uh, defense sometimes it resistances to certain things as long as you have those on your force one of your four slots you're getting that even if you don't have that weapon currently being used so what you want to do is find the best royal arms that you have found and equip them on noctis and keep one slot for his actual weapon number 12 a better engine blade this quest is very important 
at the end of the better engine blade quest there's three quests in the chain at the end of the chain you will get one of the best swords in the game the ultima blade and this can be completed pretty early in your game now i'm going to go over where to find each item for each part of the quest so that you can get your ultima blade as soon as possible for the first quest sid is looking for a rusted bit now this is actually easy to find if you just go to Golden Key, the dock where the ferry is supposed to be, there's a tall pole that has like a swirly blue design on it. And it is past Dino, if you know what I'm talking about with Dino. You go past him and you run all the way down to the edge of the, the dock. And it's just sitting right there. You pick it up, that's your rusted bit, take it back to Sid. After you give it to him though, it's very important that you do two quests or two hunts. Now hunts are obviously easier, you just go into Taka's place, grab grab a hunt, even if you've already done it, go do it, come back, do another one, and then when you, when you come back and turn it in, you need to go rest. You need to go to the trailer and go to sleep. When you wake up, Sid should call you, tell you your, your item is ready, you go get it, now you have the Engine Blade 2. When you have the Engine Blade 2, talk to him again, and he's, or you don't even have to talk to him again, I think it just tells you. Uh, he's going to want you to find him a glass gemstone to get to Engine Blade 3. The glass gemstone is also easy to find, but you have to be in Chapter 3. In Chapter 3, go to Lestalem, and right on the, the beginning strip there, near where you park your car, there's a building called Newsfield, I believe. It's a blue sign, white letters, Newsfield. If you go under or between the pillars of that, sh that building, there's a bunch of tables. The glass gemstone is on one of the tables. Just pick it up, swing back over to Hammerhead, give it to Sid, go do two or three hunts, go to sleep. When you wake up, your dream, or your uh, Engine Blade 3 will be ready. Now that you're on the last quest of a better Engine Blade, this one is going to actually take some doing. And sometimes it can be a big pain in the ass. For this one, you're going to want to go to Old Lestalem and you're going to want to take the hunt, the last Spear of Corns. I don't really remember what hunt rank you need to be, but I would say three is probably a pretty good start. But you're going to take the last Spear of Corns hunt. You're going to go down to the hunt area. Now, when you get to a hunt, there's the big circle that tells you the hunt area. Stand just outside of that circle and save it. Uh, this actually works a lot better if you use the mother and child plate I believe or mother and child bowl or something like that one of the foods it gives you a plus 50% item discovery uh, so if at all possible and you can find the mother and child food thing uh, in Lestalem near where you park your car there should be a table with a mother and a child eating just walk up to them and Ignis will creepily look over their shoulder figure out what they're eating and he'll tell you he's got a new recipe anyway back to it you want to save your game outside of the range of the hunt the reason you're doing this is because the drop rate for this horn is actually kind of terrible, even with the food. After you've saved it, go into the area. There's going to be three spirit corns and two dual corns. What you want to do is kill all three of the spirit corns and leave the dual corns alone. After you've got all three of those spirit corns done, run back outside the hunt area and save it again. The reason you're saving it the first time is because you don't want to accidentally kill a dual corn, and if you do, it kind of it, it hurts your chances a little bit of getting this sturdy hexahorn. Now, after you've saved your game the second time, go back in. What you need to do is break the horns of the dual horns. The easiest way I've found to do this is to warp to the point of the rock just in the middle of the little arena that you're fighting these guys in. And from there, in wait mode, make sure you target their horns and warp strike it over and over and over and over until it breaks. Now the item is actually going to drop on the break. If you break the horn and you don't get an item, that means you didn't get the drop. So go back to the middle, target the other one, do the same thing to that one and try to break its horn. Now if neither of them drop it, finish the hunt as usual and you've got two options. You can either go turn in the hunt and retake it and come back or you can simply load your game. Now remember, getting the sturdy hexel horn is on the break. When you break it, you'll see it down at the bottom. It'll say you've got a sturdy hexel horn. Once you have that, head on over to Hammerhead, give it to Sid, go do three, 
quests this time. It is definitely three for this one. Three hunts or three quests. Sleep, and when you wake up, you'll have the second best straight sword in the game. The Ultima, or Ultima Blade. This blade is pretty cool because it does a shit ton of damage, but it also steals element or elements of the enemies that you've beaten. Uh, obviously, that is great for making spells and whatnot. And it just cuts down on how many times you have to go find the nodes. Number 13, food. Now, I'm not going to be talking about all the different types of food because there are so many of them. And a lot of them are really, really good, especially in early game. But the food that I'm going to be talking about is actually a late game food. So it may not help you right off the bat, but as early as chapter 3, I believe you can go there and get it. I'm going to be talking about the Crispy Zoo Tenders. The Crispy Zoo Tenders give you a decent amount of HP. I believe it's 2,000. I don't know, you can probably see it on the screen here. But what it does is it gives you a plus 80% critical hit rate. Now, critical hits are pretty important, but you may not exactly know why. In most video games, critical hits just mean that you do like 1.5 times damage or 2 times damage, and that's really cool. It does that here as well. I think it's 1.5. But in Final Fantasy XV, critical hits actually stagger smaller enemies. So if you're fighting a whole bunch of little enemies and you've got this extra critical hit rate, it's going to make the fights a lot easier because you're knocking them around, you're knocking them down, it's hard for them to attack back. And plus 80% is a ridiculously high number. As a matter of fact, it's almost a guaranteed crit. You're going to see one or two white numbers, but most of them are going to be the critical hits because you've already got an inherent critical hit like percentage. In order to get the recipe for Crispy Zoo Tenders, though, you have to complete a specific hunt in the Rovato region. And this is a pretty high level hunt, but it shouldn't take too much grinding to get to the rank that you need. I believe it's four or five. Uh, it's probably four. And this is going to task you to go all the way into the Ravato mountain, all the way up to the top and fight the zoo. Now the zoo is a really cool fight to begin with. I'm not going to spoil it, but it is one of the hunts that actually has like story to it. It's really cool, but to get this recipe, you have to kill the hunt and get the zoo tender to drop. That is the meat of the zoo. Once you do that, Ignis will tell you that he's got the recipe and you're, you're good to go. Now this recipe is one zoo tender and one fine clean wheat. You can buy both of these things in Lestalum on the same vendor. Now they're pretty pricey, but you can do side quests for this vendor to reduce his prices. Now they don't ever really get that low. I think the zoo tender is 2,400 or 2,500 and the clean wheat is less than 700, but it takes one of each and it is an amazing food. The other food is the marrow shroom chowder that takes Kujata marrow, Vesprooms and Malma shrooms. Now I don't necessarily remember how to get Vesprooms and Malma shrooms. I remember just finding them out in the wild up in the Vesper pool. Um, and that's, that's a pretty late game area. But you can buy the Kujata Mero in the same vendor that sells the Zoo Tender and the Fine Clean Wheat. Now this particular food will give you guaranteed critical hits, which is great. But personally, I, I prefer the Crispy Zoo Tenders just because they're easier to get and 80% is good enough for me. Number 14, the Armager. The Armager is more than just an amazing attack that does a lot of damage. It also keeps you from dying. You can't die while you're doing the armature attack. You can take damage, and it can be very scary when you're done because you'll probably be left with like one HP, but it gives you enough time as the animation is ending to go ahead and hit that, uh, that item button and pause time and use an item. Now remember when you use items in this game, you're invincible until you're done using those items. So as soon as the armature is done, go ahead and hit the item button and use a potion or something, you should be good to go. The armature does a ridiculous amount of damage, especially once you've gotten more of the royal arms, and even further when you've unlocked the armature chain. What the armature chain does is if you're if all your bros are real close to you, then Noctis pretty much lends his power to them so that they can all stand in the line and just wail on enemies with the royal arms. It's really cool looking and it does a lot of damage, and if you have the armature chain, it, it increases the iframes even further. During the armature chain, you actually can't take any damage, so it's really cool. Uh, what I tend to like to do is use armature, and as the as the bar is ticking down, when it gets to about a quarter, then you hit the armature chain, 
to get everybody into it, and it does a lot of damage. And I've killed bosses at from half health with the Armager Chain. It's crazy. Number 15, Warp Strikes for AP. Now, in the Ascension Grid, you can unlock an ability that gives you AP every time you kill something with a Warp Strike. Now, this is really cool because it, it supplements the AP that you're already getting from leveling. And if you're high enough level, you can go down to the Hammerhead area and one-shot entire packs of enemies for just a ridiculous amount of AP. Now, there is a, a pretty good AP farming technique that is... I guess surface kind of recently we won't be going into that because I haven't actually tested it uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't work because I haven't tested it but I, I don't really know how to tell you to do it because I haven't done it but it involves a shield of shield of the just and just warp striking the hell out of things with an AoE but this is very important because you're gonna be doing this a lot anyway because warp strikes are very powerful so basically as you're fighting something if it gets really low, just warp strike it to kill it and get an AP out of it. Simple as that. Number 16, Gravisphere. Gravisphere is a technique from Prompto that takes two technique bars, and it doesn't seem that great right off the bat, but its utility is amazing. Now, a lot of people have been asking how to cast spells at enemies without hitting your own party. Gravisphere is the best way. Once you get two Technique Bars, go ahead and tell Prompto to do his Gravisphere. He'll shoot it, all the enemies will get sucked into it, and then you can throw a spell at it and hit them all at the same time. It's absolutely amazing, and it looks awesome. Number 17, making money. There's one super quick way to make a ridiculous amount of money, but it takes a little while to get to. Now, there are a lot of guides out there that tell you how to get a, a lot of money and, you know, like redoing a specific hunt over at the Varanus Mart, and that's probably a little bit faster, but if you need a whole lot of money right up front, this is the best way that I've found to do it. If you go to Altissia, there is a Justice Monsters 5 machine that takes 10k to play. Now, the top reward for this, for getting 99 chests, is a wind-up Lord Vaxos doll. Now, this doll has a couple uses, but the most important use, for me, it, it, within the, the bounds of this guide, is that it sells for 500k. Now, the easy way to get this is when you go into Justice Monsters 5, you're not trying to kill the enemies in it. What you're trying to do is hit the bumpers. The bumpers add up like a bonus score, and when you get to the top, you get a like a roulette roll or a slot machine roll that will give you either uh, chests or buffs or health or just points. Uh, so it's a crapshoot, but the cool thing about this game is that the game never ends. So each stage that you're, you're doing in Just Monsters 5 has up to four bonus rolls. So what you want to do is keep hitting the bumpers. But, you might want to take it down to like one enemy so you're not going to get your your ball killed but uh, you want to hit the bumpers until you get all four in each stage and then go ahead and do the stage and move on to the next one and then keep hitting the bumpers until you get all four there now some of these setups in like the layouts of the bumpers is kind of tricky uh, keep in mind that you can hold the stick left or right when you hit a to kind of slice your uh, your ball so when you have a bumper in the middle of the, the gameplay area and it's, it's kind of hard or tricky to time to get it, just wait until your ball is at the very top of the left or the right and then hold the stick toward the wall and hit A. Your ball will bounce off the wall and hit the bumper in the middle. Some of these layouts are very easy. You can just wait until it's up at the corner and hit A and it'll shoot straight to the bumper. Whatever works for you. Just make sure that you get all four of these bonuses each stage and you'll very quickly get to 99. When you get to 99, just exit out of the game and you'll get your wind up Lord Vaxos. You can also do that in the regular 10 gil game, but you get like a Celestriad, which isn't all that great. But let's talk about the Lord Vaxos for a second because it is pretty damn good item. Like I said, you can sell it for 500k. The other use for it is to make a spell with it that actually creates one of the ancient magics. Most important part about this is this spell will break the damage limit. It will be able to go over 9999. So it's really up to you which way you want to use it. I sold mine instantly 
and used it to buy all of the potions, high potions, elixir, elixirs, high elixirs, and phoenix downs that I will ever need, ever. Number 18 is the most important one, and that is make sure that you save all the time. Save all the time. If the game will let you save, you should be saving. There are, we all know that there are problems with the game sometimes where it crashes. We all know that things can happen that will get you killed. Uh, you know, when you were least expecting it, you could run into one of the world bosses and it'll tear you up. Um, there is actually something with the regalia in post-game that can instantly kill you, and I don't like it at all. Uh, but it, it happens, so you got to be careful. In any case, guys, that was my 19 tips for kicking ass in Lucis. And if I didn't cover anything that you really want to know, keep in mind that I've put over 100 hours into this game. Chances are, if you have a question, I might be able to answer it for you. Leave it down in the comments. Uh, if you like this video, hit that like button. I really appreciate everybody watching. And if you have anything to say, like I said, throw it down in the comments. Ask me some questions. I appreciate each and every one of you. I'll see you guys in the next video.